Five Children and It by E. Nesbitt Read by Samantha Bond The house was three miles from the station but before the dusty hired fly had rattled along for five minutes the children began to put their heads out of the carriage window and to say aren't we nearly there and every time they passed a house they all said oh is this it but it never was till they reached the very top of the hill and then there was a white house with a green garden and an orchard beyond and mother said here we are how white the house is said robert and look at the roses said anthea and the plums said jane it is rather decent cyril admitted the baby said want you go walkie and the fly stopped with a last rattle and jolt it was not really a pretty house at all father used to say that the ironwork on the roof was like an architect's nightmare but the house was deep in the country with no other house in sight and the children had been in london for two years and so the white house seemed to them a sort of fairy palace set down in an earthly paradise the children had explored the gardens and the outhouses thoroughly before they were caught and cleaned for tea and they saw quite well that they were certain to be happy at the white house the best part of it all was that there were no rules about not going to places and not doing things the house was on the edge of a hill with a wood behind it and a chalk quarry on one side and a gravel pit on the other now children will believe almost anything and grown-ups know this that is why they tell you that the earth is round like an orange when you can see perfectly well that it is flat and lumpy and why they say the earth goes round the sun when you can see for yourself any day that the sun gets up in the morning and goes to bed at night like a good sun as it is and the earth knows its place and lies as still as a mouse yet i dare say you believe all that about the earth and the sun and if so you will find it quite easy to believe that before anthea and cyril and the others had been a week in the country they had found a fairy at least they called it that because that was what it called itself and of course it knew best but it was not like any fairy you ever saw or heard of or read about it was at the gravel pits father had had to go away suddenly on business and mother had gone away to stay with granny who was not very well they both went in a great hurry and when they had gone the house seemed dreadfully quiet and empty and the children wished they had something to do it was cyril who said i say let's take our margate spades and go and dig in the gravel pits we can pretend it's the seaside each of the children carried its own spade and took it in turns to carry the lamb he was the baby and they called him that because ba was the first thing he ever said they called anthea panther which seems silly when you read it but when you say it sounds a little like her name the gravel pit was very large and wide with grass growing round the edges at the top and dry stringy wild flowers purple and yellow it was like a giant's wash hand basin the children built a castle then Cyril wanted to dig out a cave to place smugglers in, but the others thought it might bury them alive. So it ended in all spades going to work to dig a hole through the castle to Australia. They dug and they dug and they dug, and their hands got sandy and hot and red. The lamb had tried to eat the sand, and had cried so hard when he found that it was not, as he had supposed, brown sugar, that he was now tired out and was lying asleep in a warm, fat bunch in the middle of the half-finished castle. Suppose the bottom of the hole gave way suddenly, Jane said, and you tumbled out among the little Australians. All the sand would get in their eyes. Cyril and Anthea knew that Australia was not quite so near as all that, but they agreed to stop using the spades and to go on with their hands. They were just making up their minds that the sand makes you thirstier when it is not by the seaside and someone had suggested going home for lemonade when anthea suddenly screamed cyril come quick oh come quick it's alive it'll get away quick they all hurried back it's a rat i shouldn't wonder said robert oh don't be silly 
said Anthea. It's much bigger. No, not the spade. You'll hurt it. Dig with your hands. And let it hurt me instead. <laughs> That's so likely, isn't it? said Cyril, seizing a spade. Oh, don't, said Anthea. Squirrel, don't. I... It sounds silly, but it said something. It really and truly did. What? It said, you let me alone. But Cyril merely observed that his sister must have gone off her nut, and he and Robert dug with spades while Anthea sat on the edge of the hole, jumping up and down with hotness and anxiety. They dug carefully, and presently everyone could see that there really was something moving in the bottom of the Australian hole. Then Anthea cried out, I'm not afraid, let me dig. Oh, I felt fur. I did indeed, I did, she cried, when suddenly a dry, husky voice in the sand made them all jump back, and their hearts jumped nearly as fast as they did. Let me alone, it said. And now everyone heard the voice and looked at the others to see if they had too. But we want to see you, said Robert bravely. I wish you'd come out, said Anthea, also taking courage. Oh, well, if that's your wish, the voice said. And the sand stirred and spun and scattered, and something brown and furry and fat came rolling out into the hole, and the sand fell off it, and it sat there yawning and rubbing the ends of its eyes with its hands. I believe I must have dropped asleep, it said, stretching itself. The children stood round the hole in a ring, looking at the creature they had found. Its eyes were on long horns like a snail's eyes, and it could move them in and out like telescopes. It had ears like a bat's ears, and its tubby body was shaped like a spider's and covered with thick, soft fur. Its legs and arms were furry too, and it had hands and feet like a monkey's. What on earth is it? Jane said. Shall we take it home? It looked scornfully at Jane's hat. Don't be frightened, said Anthea. We don't want to hurt you, you know. Hurt me, it said. Me, frightened. Upon my word, why you talk as if I were nobody in particular. All its fur stood out like a cat's when it's going to fight. Well, said Anthea, still kindly, perhaps if we knew who you are in particular, we could think of something to say that wouldn't make you cross. Everything we've said so far seems to have. Who are you? And don't get angry, because we really don't know. You don't know, it said. Well, I knew the world had changed, but, well, really. Do you mean to tell me seriously you don't know a Samiad when you see one? A Samiad? <laughs> That's Greek to me. So it is to everyone, said the creature sharply. Well, in plain English, then... A sand fairy. Don't you know a sand fairy when you see one? Jane hastened to say, Of course, I see you are now. It's quite plain now one comes to look at you. Oh, do talk some more, Robert cried. I didn't know you were a sand fairy, but I knew directly I saw you that you were very much the most wonderfulest thing I'd ever seen. The sand fairy seemed a shade less disagreeable after this. It isn't talking, I mind, it said, as long as you are reasonably civil. If you talk nicely to me, perhaps I'll answer you, and perhaps I won't. Now say something. Of course, no one could think of anything to say. But at last Robert thought of, how long have you lived here? And he said it at once. Oh, ages, several thousand years, replied the Samiad. Tell us all about it. Do. It's all in books. Oh, tell us everything you can about yourself, said Jane. We don't know anything about you, and you are so nice. It drew its eyes in and said, How very sunny it is. Quite like old times. Where do you get your megatheriums from now? What? said the children all at once. Ah, pterodactyls plentiful now, the sand fairy went on. The children were unable to reply. What do you have for breakfast, the fairy said impatiently, 
And who gives it to you? Um, eggs and bacon and bread and milk and porridge and things. Mother gives it to us. What are Mega What's Its Names and Terra What Do You Call Them's and does anyone have them for breakfast? Why? Almost everyone had pterodactyl for breakfast in my time. Pterodactyls were something like crocodiles and something like birds. I believe they were very good grilled. Of course, there were heaps of sand fairies then, and in the morning early, you went out and hunted for them, and when you'd found one, it gave you your wish. People used to send their little boys down to the seashore early in the morning before breakfast to get the day's wishes. And very often, the eldest boy in the family would be told to wish for a megatherium, ready jointed for cooking. It was as big as an elephant, you see, so there was a good deal of meat on it. And if they wanted fish, the ichthyosaurus was asked for. He was twenty to forty feet long, so there was plenty of him. And for poultry, there was the plesiosaurus. There were nice pickings on that, too. There must have been heaps and heaps of cold meat left over, said Anthea, who meant to be a good housekeeper one day. Oh, no, said the Samiad. That would never have done. Why, of course, at sunset, what was left over disappeared. Then the sand fairy frowned and began to dig very fast with its furry hands. Oh, don't go, they all cried. Tell us more about it. Was the world like this then? It stopped digging. Not a bit, it said. We sand fairies used to live on the seashore, and the children used to come with their little flint spades and flint pails and make castles for us to live in. That's thousands of years ago. But I hear that children still build castles on the sand. It's difficult to break yourself of a habit. But why did you stop living in the castles? asked Robert. It's a sad story, said the Samiad gloomily. It was because they would build moats to the castles, and the nasty, wet, bubbling sea used to come in, and of course, as soon as a sand fairy got wet, it caught cold and generally died. And so there got to be fewer and fewer, and whenever you found a fairy and had a wish, you used to wish for a megatherium and eat twice as much as you wanted, because it might be weeks before you got another wish. And did you get wet? Robert inquired. The sand fairy shuddered. <sighs> Only once, it said. The end of the twelfth hair of my top left whisker. I still feel the place in damp weather. It was only once, but it was quite enough for me. I went away as soon as the sun had dried my poor dear whisker. I scurried away to the back of the beach and dug myself a house deep in warm, dry sand. And there I've been ever since. And the sea changed its lodgings afterwards. And now I'm not going to tell you another thing. Oh, just one more, please, said the children. Can you give wishes now? Of course, it said. Didn't I give you yours a few minutes ago? You said, I wish you'd come out. And I did. Oh, please, mayn't we have another? Yes, but be quick about it. I'm tired of you. No one could think of anything. Only Anthea managed to remember a private wish of her own and Jane's, which they had never told the boys. She knew the boys would not care about it, but still it was better than nothing. I wish we were all as beautiful as the day she said in a great hurry. The children looked at each other, but each could see the others were not any better looking than usual. The Samiad pushed out its long eyes and seemed to be holding its breath and swelling itself out till it was twice as fat and furry as before. Suddenly, it let its breath go in a long sigh. I'm really afraid I can't manage it, it said apologetically. I must be out of practice. But if you'll be contented with one wish a day amongst the lot of you, I dare say I can screw myself up to it. Do you agree to that? Yes, oh yes, said Jane and Anthea. It stretched out its eyes farther than ever 
and swelled and swelled and swelled, and everyone was very much relieved when it suddenly let out its breath and went back to its proper size. <sighs> That's all right, it said, panting heavily. It'll come easier tomorrow. Did it hurt much? asked Anthea. Only my poor whisker, thank you, he said. But you're a kind and thoughtful child. Good day. It scratched suddenly and fiercely with its hands and feet and disappeared in the sand. Then the children looked at each other, and each child suddenly found itself alone with three perfect strangers, all radiantly beautiful. They stood for some moments in perfect silence. Each thought that its brothers and sisters had wandered off, and that these strange children had stolen up unnoticed while it was watching the swelling form of the sand fairy. Anthea spoke first. Excuse me, she said very politely to Jane, who now had enormous blue eyes and a cloud of russet hair. But have you seen two little boys and a little girl anywhere about? I was just going to ask you that, said Jane. And then Cyril cried, Why, it's you! I know the hole in your pinafore. You are Jane, aren't you? And you're the panther I can see your dirty handkerchief that you forgot to change after you cut your thumb. Crikey! The wish has come off after all. I say, am I as handsome as you are? If you're Cyril, I liked you much better as you were before, said Anthea decidedly. You look like the picture of the young chorister with your golden hair. You'll die young, I shouldn't wonder. And if that's Robert, he's like an Italian organ grinder. His hair's all black. Still, it's no use finding fault with each other. Let's get the lamb and lug it home to dinner. The servants will admire us most awfully, you'll see. Baby was just waking when they got to him, and all of the children were relieved to find that he at least was not as beautiful as the day, but just the same as usual. I suppose he's too young to have wishes, naturally, said Jane. We shall have to mention him specially next time. Anthea ran forward and held out her arms. Come to own Panther, Ducky, she said. Go away long, said the baby. Come to own Pussy, said Jane. The lamb's lip trembled. Then he howled, giving way altogether. Then the children knew the worst. The baby did not know them. They looked at each other in despair. This is most truly awful said Cyril. We've got to make friends with him. Fancy having to make friends with our own baby. It's too silly. That, however, was exactly what they had to do, and at long last he consented to allow these strangers to carry him home by turns. Oh, thank goodness we're home, said Jane, staggering through the iron gate to where Martha, the nursemaid, stood at the front door, shading her eyes with her hand and looking out anxiously. Here, do take baby. Martha snatched the baby from her arms. Thanks be he's safe back, she said. Where are the others, and whoever to goodness gracious are all of you? We're us, of course, said Robert. And who's us when you're at home, said Martha scornfully, and tried to shut the door in his face. I know we look different, but I'm Anthea, and we're so tired and it's long past dinner time. Then go home to your dinners, whoever you are. And if our children put you up to this play-acting, you can tell them from me they'll catch it, so they know what to expect. With that, she did bang the door. Presently, Cook put her head out of a bedroom window and said, If you don't take yourselves off and that pressure's sharp, I'll go and fetch the police. And she slammed down the window. It's no good, said Anthea. Oh, do, do come away before we get sent to prison. The boys said it was nonsense, but all the same they followed the others out into the lane. We shall be our proper selves after sunset, I suppose, said Jane. I don't know, said Cyril sadly. It mayn't be like that now. Things have changed a good deal since Megatherium times. Anthea began to cry. So did Jane. Again they tried in vain to get the servants in the White House to let them in and listen to their tale. 
But finally, Martha emptied a toilet jug of cold water over Robert from a top window and said, Go along with you, you nasty little Italian monkey. It came at last to their sitting down in a row under the hedge, with their feet in a dry ditch, waiting for sunset. The silence was broken by Jane. She said, If we do come out of this all right, we'll ask the Samoyad to make it so that the servants don't notice anything different, no matter what wishes we have. The others only grunted. They were too wretched even to make good resolutions. At last they all fell asleep in a row, with their beautiful eyes shut and their beautiful mouths open. Anthea woke first. The sun had set and twilight was coming on. <gasps> Wake up, she said, almost in tears of joy. Cyril, how nice and ugly you do look, with your old freckles and your brown hair and your little eyes. And so do you all, she added, so that they might not feel jealous. When they got home, they were very much scolded by Martha. Where on earth have you been all this time, you naughty little things, you? In the lane. Why didn't you come home hours ago? We couldn't, because the children who were as beautiful as the day kept us there till after sunset. You don't know how we hated them. Oh, do, do give us some supper. We are so hungry. Hungry? I should think so, said Martha angrily. Now mind, if you see them again... Don't you speak to them, not one word, nor so much as a look, but come straight away and tell me. I'll spoil their beauty for them. Oh, we'll take jolly good care we never do see them again, said Robert. And they never have. The children awoke the next morning and resolved to go up to the gravel pits directly after breakfast and have another wish. Only we'll make up our minds, solid before we go, what it is we do want, said Cyril. And no one must ask for anything unless the others agree first. Jane felt that Cyril was right, but Anthea was not so sure, till after they had seen Martha and heard her full and plain reminders about their naughty conduct the day before. I say said Cyril suddenly. Where's the lamb? Martha's going to take him to Rochester to see her cousins. Mother said she might. She's dressing him now, said Jane. She's going by carrier. Let's see them off. Then we shall have done a polite and kindly act, and we shall be quite sure we've got rid of them for the day. So they did. When the white tilt and red wheels of the carrier had slowly vanished in a swirl of chalk dust. And now for the Samiad said Cyril. They set off. As they went, they decided on the wish they would ask for. They had made a ring of stones round the place where the sand fairy had disappeared, so they easily found the spot. The sun was burning, and the sand was very hot to touch. The boys uncovered their spades from the sand heap where they had buried them, and began to dig, and presently came across the spider-shaped brown hairy body, long arms and legs, bat's ears and snail's eyes of the sand fairy himself. Everyone drew a deep breath of satisfaction, for now, of course, it couldn't have been a dream. The Samiad sat up and shook the sand out of its fur. How's your left whisker this morning? said Anthea politely. Nothing to boast of, said it. It had a rather restless night, but thank you for asking. I say, said Robert, do you feel up to giving wishes today? Because we very much want an extra one besides the regular one. The extra's a very little one, he added reassuringly. Hmm, said the Sand Fairy. Let me hear it then. We don't want the servants to notice the gifts you give us. Are kind enough to give us, said Anthea in a whisper. Are kind enough to give us, I mean, said Robert. The fairy swelled himself out a bit, let his breath go and said, I've done that for you. 
It was quite easy. People don't notice things much anyway. What's the next wish? We want, said Robert slowly, to be rich beyond the dreams of something or other. Well, it won't do you much good, that's one comfort, the Sand Fairy muttered. How much do you want, and will you have it in gold or notes? Gold, please, and millions of it. This gravel pit full be enough, said the fairy in an offhand manner. Oh, yes. Then get out before I begin or you'll be buried alive in it. It made its skinny arms so long and waved them so frighteningly that the children ran as hard as they could towards the road by which carts used to come to the gravel pits. Only Anthea had presence of mind enough to shout a timid, Good morning. I hope your whisker will be better tomorrow. As she ran. On the road, they turned and looked back, and they had to shut their eyes and open them very slowly, a little bit at a time, because the sight was too dazzling for their eyes to be able to bear it. For the whole of the sand pit was full, right up to the very top, with new, shining gold pieces. Where the road for the carts wound into the gravel pit, the gold lay in heaps like stones lie by the roadside and all the gleaming heap was minted gold. The children stood with their mouths open, and no one said a word. At last, Robert stopped and picked up one of the loose coins from the edge of the heap by the cart road and looked at it. He looked on both sides. Then he said in a low voice, quite different to his own, It's not sovereigns. It's gold anyway, said Cyril, and now they all began to talk at once. They all picked up the golden treasure by handfuls and let it run through their fingers like water, and the chink it made as it fell was wonderful music. At first, they quite forgot to think of spending the money. It was so nice to play with. Well, look here, Cyril said. If this is to do us any good, it's no good our staying gasping at it like this. Let's fill our pockets and go and buy things. Don't you forget... It won't last after sunset. I tell you what, there's a pony and cart in the village. Do you want to buy that? asked Jane. No, silly. We'll hire it, and then we'll go to Rochester and buy heaps and heaps of things. Look here, let's each take as much as we can carry. But it's not sovereigns. They've got a man's head on one side and a thing like the ace of spades on the other. Fill your pockets with it, I tell you, and come along. They all sat down and began to fill their pockets. Then they set off to walk to the village. On the way, Jane said, I don't see how we're to spend it at all, but directly we get to the village, we'll buy some biscuits. I know it's long past dinner time. The haze of the heat, the blue of the wood smoke, made a sort of dim, misty cloud over the red roofs by the time they reached the village. The four sat down heavily on the first bench they came to, it happened to be outside the Blue Boar Inn. It was decided that Cyril should go inside and ask for ginger beer, while the others sat in the sun and waited. He returned indignantly and said, I had to pay for it out of my own two and sevenpence that I was going to buy rabbits with, he said. They wouldn't change the gold. And when I pulled out a handful, the man just laughed and said it was card counters. And I got some sponge cakes too, out of a glass jar on the bar counter, and some biscuits with caraways in. It's my turn now to try and buy something with the money, Anthea said. Where is the pony cart kept? It was at the checkers, and Anthea went in the back way to the yard, because they all knew that little girls ought not to go into the bars of public houses. She came out, as she herself said, pleased, but not proud. He'll be ready in a brace of shakes, he says, she remarked. And he's to have one sovereign, or whatever it is, to drive us into Rochester and back, besides waiting there till we've got everything we want. I think I managed very well. You think yourself jolly clever, I dare say, said Cyril moodily. How did you do it? I just found a young man doing something to a horse's leg with a sponge and a pail, and I held out one sovereign and I said, Do you know what this is? He said no, and he'd call his father. And the old man came... And he said it was a spade guinea. And he said, 
was it my own to do as I liked with? And I said yes. And I asked about the pony cart, and I said he could have the guinea if he'd drive us into Rochester, and his name is S. Crispin, and he said, right -o. It was a new sensation to be driven in a smart pony trap along pretty country roads, and the old man put them down by the bridge at their request. If you were going to buy a carriage and horses, where would you go? asked Cyril, as if he were only asking for the sake of something to say. Mm, Billy Pease Marsh at the Saracen's Head, said the old man promptly. If your pa's thinking of a turnout of any sort, there ain't a straighter man in Rochester, nor a civiler spoken than Billy, though I says it. Thank you, said Cyril. The Saracen's Head. To the children's amazement, the tradespeople of Rochester seemed to shrink from the glittering fairy gold. Foreign money, they called it, for the most part. They tried several shops, but nobody cared to change a guinea that day in Rochester. And as they went from shop to shop, they got dirtier and dirtier and very hungry. But they found no one would give them anything to eat for their guineas. After trying two pastry cooks in vain, they formed a plan of campaign in whispers and carried it out in desperation. They marched into a third pastry cook's. Beale, his name was. And before the people behind the counter could interfere, each child had seized three new penny buns, clapped the three together between its dirty hands, and taken a big bite out of the triple sandwich. Then they stood at bay with the twelve buns in their hands and their mouths very full indeed. The shocked pastry cook bounded round the corner. Here, said Cyril, speaking as distinctly as he could, and holding out the guinea he had got ready before entering the shop. Pay yourself out of that. Mr. Beale snatched the coin, bit it, and put it in his pocket. Off you go, he said brief and stern like the man in the song. But the change, said Anthea, who had a saving mind. Change, said the man. I'll change you how you goes. And may you think yourselves lucky I don't send for the police to find out where you got it. In the castle gardens, the millionaires finished the buns. But even the stoutest heart quailed at the thought of venturing to sound Mr. Billy Peasmarsh at the Saracen's Head on the subject of a horse and carriage. The boys would have given up the idea, but Jane was always a hopeful child, and Anthea generally an obstinate one, and their earnestness prevailed. The whole party, by this time indescribably dirty, therefore betook itself to the Saracen's Head. Mr. Peasmarsh was in the yard, and Robert opened the business in these terms. They tell me you have a lot of horses and carriages to sell. Well, we want to buy some horses and carriages, and a man told us that you were straight and civil-spoken. Upon my soul, said Mr. Peasmarsh, shall I trot the whole stable out for your honour's worship to see, or shall I send round to the bishop to see if he's a nag or two to dispose of? Please do said Robert, if it's not too much trouble. It would be very kind of you. Mr. Peasmarsh put his hands in his pockets and laughed, and they did not like the way he did it. Then he shouted, Willem! A stooping ostler appeared in a stable door. Here, Willem. Come and look at this here young duke. Wants to buy the old stud, lock, stock and barrel. And ain't got tuppence in his pocket to bless himself with. I'll go bail. Willem's eyes followed his master's pointing thumb with contemptuous interest. Do we for sure, he said. But Robert spoke, though both the girls were now pulling at his jacket and begging him to come along. He spoke, and he was very angry. He said, I'm not a young duke, and I never pretended to be. And as for tuppence, what do you call this? And before the others could stop him, he had pulled out two fat handfuls of shining guineas and held them out for Mr. Peasmarsh to look at. He snatched one up in his finger and thumb. He bit it and Jane expected him to say, the best horse in my stables is at your service. But the others knew better. Still, it was a blow even to the most desponding when he said shortly, Willem, shut the yard doors. And Willem grinned and went to shut them. Good afternoon, said Robert hastily. We shan't buy any of your horses now, whatever you say, and I hope it'll be a lesson to you. 
he had seen a little side gate open and was moving towards it as he spoke. But Billy Peasmarsh put himself in the way. Not so fast, you young off scouring, he said. Willem, fetch the police. Willem went. The children stood huddled together like frightened sheep, and Mr. Peasmarsh spoke to them till the police arrived. He said many things. Among other things, he said, Nice lot you are, aren't you? Come in tempting honest men with your guineas, and dragging little gals into it, too. Here, I'll let the gals go if you come along to the police quiet. We won't be let go, said Jane heroically. Not without the boys. It's our money just as much as theirs, you wicked old man. Where do you get it, then? said the man, softening slightly. Jane cast a silent glance of agony at the others. Lost your tongue, eh? Come, speak up. Where'd you get it? Out of the gravel pit, said truthful Jane. There's a fairy there, all over brown fur, with ears like a bat's and eyes like a snail's, and he gives you a wish a day and they all come true. Touched in the air, eh? said the man in a low voice. And now Willem came back with a policeman, with whom Mr. Peasmarsh spoke long in a hoarse, earnest whisper. I dare say you're right said the policeman at last. Anyway, I'll take them on a charge of unlawful possession pending inquiries, and the magistrate will deal with the case. Now then, come along, youngsters. No use making a fuss. You bring the gals along, Mr. Peasmarsh, sir, and I'll shepherd the boys. Speechless with rage and horror, the four children were driven along the streets of Rochester. Tears of anger and shame blinded them, so that when Robert ran right into a passerby, he did not recognise her till a well-known voice said, Well, if ever I did. Oh, Master Robert, whatever have you been doing now? And another voice, quite as well-known, said, Panty, won't go own Panty. They had run into Martha and the baby. Martha behaved admirably. She refused to believe a word of the policeman's story, or of Mr. Peasmarsh's either, even when they made Robert turn out his pockets in an archway and show the guineas. I don't see nothing, she said. You've gone out of your senses, you two. There ain't any gold there, only the poor child's hands all over crock and dirt, and like the very chimbley. Oh, that I should ever see the day. And the children thought this very noble of Martha, even rather wicked, till they remembered how the fairy had promised that the servants should never notice any of the fairy gifts. It was getting dusk when they reached the police station, where the policeman told his tale to an inspector. Produce the coins, officer, said the inspector. Turn out your pockets, said the constable. Cyril desperately plunged his hands in his pockets, stood still a moment, and then began to laugh. An odd sort of laugh that hurt and that felt much more like crying. His pockets were empty. So were the pockets of the others. For, of course, at sunset, all the fairy gold had vanished away. Turn out your pockets and stop that noise, said the inspector. Cyril turned out his pockets, and every pocket was empty. Well, said the inspector. I don't know how they done it, artful little beggars. They walked in front of me the old way, so as for me to keep my eye on them and not attract a crowd and obstruct the traffic. It's very remarkable, said the inspector, frowning. If you've quite done a browbeating of the innocent children, said Martha, I'll hire a private carriage and we'll drive home to their papa's mansion. You'll hear about this again, young man. Take them away, for goodness sake, said the inspector crossly. But as they left the police station, he said, Now then, to the policeman and Mr. Peasmarsh, and he said it twenty times as crossly as he had spoken to Martha. Martha was as good as her word. She took them home in a very grand carriage, because the carrier's cart was gone, and though she had stood by them so nobly with the police, she was so angry with them, as soon as they were alone for traipsing into Rochester by themselves, 
that none of them dared to mention the old man with the pony cart from the village who was waiting for them in Rochester. And so, after one day of boundless wealth, the children found themselves sent to bed in deep disgrace. End of side one.